Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are doing part two of our uh, MTGO Vintage Cube update discussion. So yesterday we went through all of the white and blue cards, along with uh, this colorless replacement, Bizarre Baghdad, replaced for currency converter. I think it's a great a great choice. Ba Bar Bizarre Baghdad's just not, doesn't go in any deck really, <laughs> except for Reanimator. And currency converter is a good change. So... This is the list. Uh, you can find it on mtgo.com. Bitter Blossom is out. Valky God of Lies is in. I like Valky being in the cube. I don't like Bitter Blossom not being in the cube. I think Bitter Blossom is a really, really good. Uh, it's good in a lot of decks. It's good in like black white mid range decks. It's good for decks that want creatures to attach equipment to. It's good for Skull Clamp. It's good for Recurring Nightmare. There's a lot of cool synergies with Bitter Blossom. It's another one of those Vintage Cube staples that is no longer earning that designation on power level. Hmm. I don't know if Valky is either, but I bet they have a Bring to Light. I bet they're putting Bring to Light in the cube. Valky is good in most black decks and combos with Bring to... <laughs> okay. Which also rotates in this time around. Fantastic. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder why I don't just... Yeah. Call of the Ring. Out. I like Call of the Ring. I think it's I think it's really good. Every time I've it was it was a card that I wasn't sure about, and then I uh, really really liked it after I played it quite a bit. So that's what's coming out for Doomsday. The long way to Doomsday finally makes its appearance. The constructed staple is very supportable in Vintage Cube. You can combine it with Thassa's Oracle or Jace Wielder of Mysteries, as well as putting together a storm pile to finish off your opponents. No one's going to have more fun than me uh, playing against that. We will call back Call of the Ring sometime down the road. Fine, sure. Custody Lich is out. This is a card I've also gained a solid appreciation for recently. And Dreams of Steel and Oil is in. I don't like this. <clears throat> Dreams of Steel and Oil says target opponent reveals their hand. You can choose an artifact or creature uh, and choose an artifact or creature in, the, in their graveyard and then you just exile both of them. I don't know. Um... The Lich was probably a bit on the edge already. No, I don't think so. I think any cards that give you the Monarchy and then also do something when you get the Monarchy are very strong. But with even more token making this time around, it will at least ride the bench for now. You took out Bitter Blossom. The high emphasis on artifacts here supported, uh, giving Black some counterplay, and excellent cards from the graveyard can be very valuable. Yeah, I don't think it's terrible. I just know that they're probably not taking out Inquisition or Duress or Thoughtseize, so there's just going to be this glut of one mana discard spells uh maybe we're wrong we'll see <clears throat> infernal grasp taking out for bitter bitter triumph this is the exact change i made in my cube as well these are both two mana removal spells that cost life this one costs two this one costs three this one can remove planeswalker and this one uh you can also discard a card instead of paying life so like the versatility on this one is just miles ahead of infernal grasp so it's just a significantly better card Bitter Triumph is another incredible cube card, along with many others from Lost Caverns. It's almost strictly better than Infernal Grasp. It's not strictly better. Almost. Almost is fair. With the ability to kill Planeswalkers and not being forced to pay life, being worth the extra one point when you do, and with discarding often being an upside. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. But yeah, if you're in a situation where you have no cards in hand, you top deck Infernal Grasp or Bitter Triumph, and you have three life, Infernal Grasp is a better card. You can kill a creature. Jadar Ghoul Caller of Nefalia just shouldn't just shouldn't be in. I I I don't think this card. It's it's like it's like it's a card doing a bad impersonation of Ophiomancer. Uh, and Black Torok. I don't know why I read Black Torok Dread Cantor coming in. Torok is fine, but the more I've played with him, the the more I think it's extremely difficult to kick him. Three Black is pretty rough. Not an easy not an easy requirement. Um. We've mentioned moving away from monocolored cards a lot, and now this. Well, we like the inclusion of Alpha Frog Vintage Cube in the Alpha Frog Vintage Cube and wanted to try it in the Magic Online Vintage Cube. We will see if the effect is worth the narrow fit. Maybe. Kite Sail Freebooter for Deep Cavern Bat. Easy cut, made the same one in my cube. Another clear upgrade. LCI has a lot of Vintage Cube treats. Like, Kite Sail Freebooter only hits uh, non-creature and on-lands. Deep Cavern Bat only hits non-lands, which is significantly better. Uh, away from the opponent, the lifelink is often important. Agreed. Lily on a last hope coming out for contagion. And my alarm is going off. Now I have to turn it off. Sorry if that was loud. 
Contagion. Few things from our advantage queue than casting high mana value spells for no mana cost. And while Contagion doesn't have the bona fides of its cycle mate force of will, we want to try it, give it a try this time. Given the addition of Vile Smasher the Fierce. And we'll have to get to that guy as well. That's a commander card that I, I like know of it, but I definitely have not played or seen it enough to, to have memorized what it does. Don't forget that this place's counters on creatures, so the effect doesn't only last until the end of turn. Yeah, I mean, negative two, negative one counters. Eh, okay. I mean, this is giving negative two total toughness for, for either five mana or two cards. I don't know. Like, I'd rather just have Liliana that does it every turn. Massacre Worm versus Massacre Girl. Sure, Massacre Worm is a great tool for heavy black midrange and reanimated decks against aggro decks or mana elves. Massacre Girl performs similar, but is a lot more reasonable to cast and can find its way into almost every any black deck, which is why she's getting the edge this time around. I mean, maybe, but a lot of times it's going to kill your own thing. It's like casting cost-wise, sure. But that doesn't mean you always want it. Like, Massacre Worm is always going to hit your opponents. It's always going to be a big threat. I mean, I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with this justification. I do like Massacre Worm a lot. I think it's a... I don't think it's a main deck card. Like, I, But I think that's fine. I think a lot of cards are not necessarily always main deck cards. I think Massacre Worm is a card you bring in when it's absolutely going to obliterate your opponent. And then it just feels like a smart choice. You get to feel smart. Murderous Rider is out. Virtue of Persistence is in. I have both of these in my queue. I don't think Murderous Rider is uh, quite ready to rotate yet. It's a step slow these days, and the life loss, the loss of life exacerbates that, with the promise of a 2-3 lifelink to help out later often not materializing in time to matter. I agree with that, though. Virtue might not stick in the vintage queue, but flexible cards like this often overperform expectations, so we want to give it a chance. Yeah, and I agree. This card is just so good. Like You can either like using it as a 2-mana removal spell or a 7-mana uh, Debtor's Nell is pretty good. Una's Prowler is out for Reign of Filth. So just to be clear, we're taking out a, uh, a reanimator piece, which is very, very cool, for a combo storm piece, which is just stellar. The Prowler isn't a stellar example of a powerful cube card, but it serves well enough for in the reanimator. I mean, it's also just a good beater. Like, if they want to discard a card every turn and take two less damage, it's fine. Luckily, we've been getting a huge influx of powerful discard outlets, so we don't... That's actually true, though. So we don't have to carry all of them around anymore. Uh, Putrid Imp can stick around at one mana. I'd rather have Luna's Prowler than Putrid Imp, and I have in my cube for quite a while. But we are letting the Prowler go. <clears throat> Reign of Filth is a cool combo card for Ritual Storm, while also having a couple neat synergies elsewhere. Sacrificing all your... It wouldn't be... I wouldn't be surprised if they also added Urborg. Uh, or if, if it was if it wasn't in there, I don't remember if it was, um, because then you just make all your land swamps and then. Oh, actually, this doesn't even need Arborg. It's just each land you control gains it. I thought I thought it was swamps like high tide. I thought it was like a high tide, uh, like high tide parallel. Rain of Filth is a cool combo card for Ritual Storm, which, while also having a couple neat synergies elsewhere. Sacrificing all your lands with a fast bond in play and casting Yogmoth's Will afterwards produces a ton of mana. And also works with Titania, Priest of Protector of Argoth. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, we shall see. Wish Claws out, which I think is fine. Beseech is in. You know what? I was really, really high on Beseech. I think it's really good because you can get a lot of your combo pieces. You can go get a Yogmoth's Will. You can go get a Splinter Twin with it. You can literally get your missing combo piece and put it directly into play if you're able to bargain. I think the problem is that three black mana is very hard to do, as I mentioned with uh, Torok. Like, there's a dex where I've been cutting Cryptic Command just because I can't get the triple blue. Like, it's just not an easy ask. Um, so while there are certainly a lot of differences between these Tutor effects, it feels like an, this feels like an upgrade Beseech the Mirror's Bargain Clause requires some setup with the payoff of getting to immediately cast your Tendrils or Yogmoth's Will for free is huge. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you just go get, like, you combo, 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 and then Beseech is literally, it's Brainstorm, it's Tendrils, it's whatever you need it to be that costs four or less. Bitter Reunion, out, NT in. I like Bitter Reunion a lot. I think it's good looting. Um, I think it's also really good to give haste when you're reanimating or, you know, getting a, an Archon of Cruelty into play somehow. While not being a particularly early pick in general did not disappoint. However, there's a whole heap of discard outlets around now and you have to make room somewhere. It's not about just being a discard outlet. It's like, like, it gets you too deeper and it also gives haste. Like, I think those are super relevant. Inti looks incredibly promising, both for her Lelia, the Blade Reforged Impression for only two mana, and for her ability, neither requiring her to attack, nor to be the discard outlet. Uh, I agree with that. I think that card's... I think Inti is great. 
Uh, NT feels like a card that will stay in the queue on power. I yeah, I I also have an NT in my queue. I think it's a fantastic. It does like so many things. It lets you discard. It lets you play free spells. It lets you put counters on things. Char for flame slash. This is fine. I have flame slash in my queue. I think it's is a is a great position for the current vintage cube meta hitting eighty five percent of creatures in this iteration. It also slots nicely into way more decks than Char does. Agree. Desperate out for Burgi. I didn't know Burgi wasn't in there. If you I, like, I feel like Burgi, if you have Storm, which they do, just have Burgi in there. That's weird. Uh, desperate indeed. Meanwhile, <laughs> Burgi should be better positioned as Iteration being another card that plays nicely with the returning Thassa's Oracle. Sure. Uh, Dire Fleet is out for Earthshaker Kenra. I recently took Earthshaker Kenra out. Um, it's a nice aggressive beetle that supports the warrior sub-theme. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. If you want to, if you want to support warriors, then you can bring, bring her back. Sure. Uh, and being able to use the graveyard for value to unlock is powerful. Eternalize is also interesting because it makes a token for cards like Snap. Yeah, this is actually doing double duty for a couple of different archetypes that they have going on. Goblin Guide out for Soul Scar Mage. I don't care about either of these cards, to be honest. I think Goblin Guide's a little bit lackluster these days. Once a premier one drop in Vintage Cube, and the reason to get into red, Goblin Guide has fallen far in its effectiveness and deck breadth. Soul Scar Mage is a red one drop with a relevant ability that gives red some play against blue creatures. All in aggression has a place for sure, but also a price, and we like trading a lower ceiling for a higher floor. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd put in Soul Scar Mage, um, but I I do think Goblin Guide is an easy cut, especially like you're putting creatures in like Ragavan now, and that's just not not the same at all. Rabble Master is out for Nahila, which is a card we looked up earlier. Supporting Nahila in the upcoming domain archetype is the reason behind the warrior swaps in the iteration. Nahila and her setup cost is not a strict upgrade, but is a choice to accommodate a specific archetype with the analog card. This one snowballs quite well, too, because she makes warrior tokens herself, activating her ability out of nowhere to turn a seemingly lost game into a victory is glorious. Is this guy? This is a warrior, though, right? This is a goblin warrior. You can tell because it's from Cons of Tarkir, and Cons of Tarkir also had a really strong warrior theme in Mardu. So, it's not from Cons of Tarkir, it's actually from uh, M20. But, yeah, they were in the same... They were in the same time, you know? Imperial Recruiter out, which makes total sense, because one of the only reasons you had Imperial Recruiter... In, well, I wouldn't say only, but one of the main reasons was Splinter Twin. So, you get rid of Imperial Recruiter, you get rid of Splinter Twin, you're getting rid of Imperial Recruiter. I also, like, I don't like the Recruiters. I think they're kind of boring. Phyrexian Dragon Engine in. I don't love this card either. I, I think I want Mishra. If I like, see, that's just the difference in play styles though. Like, I want to meld this card. A lot of people just want a, a card that lets you draw three cards and discard your hand, which presumably has no cards in it at the time. Recruited departs with the Kiki Twin package this time. Phyrexian Dragon Engine plays nicely with the robot theme and provides an aggressive option to cast off of Mishra's workshop now that Crystalline Giant has rotated out. Yeah, so this should have been a Phyrexian, this should have been a Crystalline Giant replacement, right? It's also nice, a nice one to bin with Goblin Engineer. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's fine. It's not a bad card. It's it's literally, it's essentially a 4-2 for 3. And then you get to unearth it. Incinerate out Tribal Flames in. Makes sense when you're going with Domain. Incinerate is a fine replaceable burn spell coming out for one that supports the incoming Domain archetype. Kiki out makes sense for I like Trumpet and Carnosaur a lot. I don't think it has to be broken. Um, where you're like you're doing nonsense combo things with it. I think it's just for six mana, a seven six trampler that also discovers is ex it's exceptional value. And the fact that you can discard it to deal three damage to a creature or planeswalker is just gravy. Uh, LCI is a cube bonanza. Multi mode cards like this are perfect for cube. It discards itself for value ahead of potential reanimation and is pretty reasonable to cast. Also, discover is not on cast like Cascade, so you can you could reanimate this and still get the discover. Uh, I expect this one to play out very well. Kiki rotates out with the pack with the packages plan, but we'll be back again someday, sure. Uh, Kumano faces Kakazan is just not. It was never really impressive to me. I don't know. I'm sure it's fine. Epicure is is fine. It gives you a discard outlet for one mana, which is nice. Dealing one damage to each opponent is like eh, whatever. Kumano faces Kakazan is a fantastic one drop for aggressive decks, but Epicure provides a lot of flexibility, creating another discard outlet in an artifact token. This is particularly relevant in this version, especially with the Bonkers Gut. True Soul Zealot incoming. I don't remember what Gut does, but we'll see. Light Up is out, which I just took out recently as well. Um, I think there's just so many abilities that let you excel the top cards of your library to play them. It's just not really necessary. And like, Questing Druid obviously does the same thing. <laughs> it's just significantly better. 
Light at the stage needs extremely low curve to be reliably good, and more and more red cards have encroached on its play until the end of next turn space. Yep, that's exactly what I... <laughs> that was so unique when it was printed. Questing Druid and Seek the Beast. I don't know what Seek the Beast is. Oh, is that... That's the... That's his... <laughs> that's his hat. That's his adventure. Uh, are solid cards individually, and their combined value and flexibility should make for a potent vintage cube card. Yeah. Mana Flare out makes total sense. The only card... The only, like... The only decks that are playing this are Storm. But I guess you're... You still have Storm, so I don't know anymore. Goblin Engineer in. Totally fine. It's like a red... It's a, it's like if Goblin Welder and Stoneforge Mystic had a child. Engineer further deepens the artifact synergies and supports some exciting combos. It's pretty really handy to bend your Sword of the Meek to combo with your Thopter Foundry, but it's also a nice value engine in general. Um, Mind Collapse is out for Pyrokinesis. I guess we're playing more free spells. Mind Collapse has been good, but the free spell should be... This should free spell should be even better. Try it with the Vile Smasher or the Fierce for some insane value. Again, we're, I, I'm not sure. Um, this seems fine. You're dealing one less damage, and you can't hit Planeswalkers, which is kind of a big deal. But, I mean, it's just really one free spell for another. I don't see that it's going to be that big of a deal. Mizium Mortars is out for Delayed Blast Fireball. Uh, this deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control. If it was cast from Exile, it deals five damage to each creature uh, they control and each opponent. So for six mana, you can you can foretell it. You can you put it away for two, and then for six, you you foretell. Museum Orders is a great flexible card. So I mean, I guess for both of them, you're paying six for the board wiping segment. This is two mana to deal with one creature. This is three mana for like a pyroclasm, basically. Uh, but Delayed Fire Blast will be our choice in this red sweeper slot this time around. It plays incredibly nicely with Bring to Light. Not to, oh, that's actually. In, are you playing it from Exile if you bring to light this? Not to mention cards like Lelia, the Blader Forge, and Questing Druid's Adventure, among many others. Uh, Mizzix Mastery's out for Synthesizer. So Synthesizer is enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield, exile the top card of your library until the end of turn. You may play that card, and then you can sack it to make a 2-2 two, two white samurai. Uh, becomes a real value engine when combined with the Goblin Engineer and is reasonable in low-curve decks as well as big mana artifact ramp. It's also a cheap card to feed to gut. Okay, tell me what gut is. <laughs> Why are we... Like, haven't we, have we... Oh, he's down here. Okay, I was like, have we not seen him yet? But they're going alphabetical by the cards that are leaving, not the cards that are coming in. So, uh, here, Warcrafting out, which is fine. I thought this card was kind of... Into Pyrite Spellbomb. Again, they're going to... They're going to tout the artifact synergies. Uh, isn't particularly exciting, but not everything has to be when it comes to the cube. Sometimes it's good to have a cheap artifact that does something down the line. It's nice to play with Emery, Luris, and Tamishi, Reality Architect, which I also assume we'll see in the multicolor section. P and Kieran Alar. Actually, did they mention Tamishi? Was it just in there from last time? Because they have um, Nahila in the non-multicolor section. They just put this as a red card. No, they didn't, I guess, because then Phyrexian Dragon Engine's a... I guess they're not necessarily sticking to... This 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 column is not necessarily red cards. They're just what they're being replaced with, so... Okay. P and Kieran Alar has not been in my cube for quite a while. I just don't think it's... I, I don't think it's impactful enough or exciting enough. And Bray's Apprentice is just a smaller P and Kieran Alar. It's a 2-3 three for 3. It makes a 1-1. One, one. And then you can sack an artifact to do a couple of different things, which is super cool. Pretty much does the same job, only better and cheaper. It grinds for value on its own, but also combines nicely with Goblin Engineer and generally plays well with all the artifact themes. Ritual out for Rite of Flame. I mean, this is the same thing, right? You're just netting one mana, but this costs one less. So, yeah, that makes sense. This makes me surprised that this was never in here for this. Steamkin out, Firebrand in... Uh, when this attacks, target creature fitting player controls with power less than Rod of Fire and can't block. So a two drop or, or a two power creature, one power creature. Uh, if you have domain, it's six mana. It gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. It costs one less for each basic land type among lands you control. Activate only once each turn. You don't have to have domain, actually. That's just, they're just calling that the ability. So if I have four different types, it costs two. That's pretty good. I mean, it's also just, it's a warrior. It's a two drop. Uh, performs very well, but we're swapping this out for more warrior support. Wattis Firebrand, Firebrand is very reasonable, even without its activated ability, so don't shy away from it just because you can't get full domain. 
But if you can, this card becomes absurd. Splinter Twin out for Valakut. Exploration. Three mana. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card for as long as it remains exiled. It's interesting because it says play, not cast. Play means you can play lands. You can put lands into play off of it, whereas cast means it just spells. But this is funny because it's whenever a land enters the battlefield on your control. So it's implied that you're going to have to use your land drop to trigger this. So it's kind of like a, it's an interesting tension where it's like, you know, we'll let you play lands off of this, but you got to find a way to do it. So like if you have a fetch land in play, you can crack your fetch land, put a land into play. And then if you hit a land off of Alicot Exploration, you can still put that into play. At the beginning of your end step, if there are no, if there are cards exiled with Valakut Exploration, put them into it's a, their owner's graveyard, then Valakut Exploration deals that much damage to each opponent. So if you don't play the card, they take one. It's kind of like, I, I think I remember this being um, Sulfuric Vortex, like a Sulfuric Vortex replacement that's dealing consistent damage over time for three mana. But then you also get like draws off of it. It's one of the payoffs for the upcoming lands archetype. Combine this with bounce lands and pretty much any card that can generate extra land drops for you. And you'll have yourself a nice vacation in Value Town. When combined with Fast Bond, this can quickly go through your entire deck. And if you're ahead on life, even kill your opponents with its end of turn trigger. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? So I'm saying like, that's funny because that's kind of what I mentioned where like, if you're able to get lands into play, you're doing a lot of stuff here. Squee is out, which is fine. I don't think like... I, I don't think you need this many 2-2 two, two for 3 goblins with haste that make 1-1s. One, like, goblin, uh, rabble master, and squee were both in here already. So that's kind of... I, I don't kind of like that kind of redundancy. Because I think, like, I'd rather have less repetitious play patterns in my cube. Like, if you're playing a red deck, I'd rather you have one version of this card and a different 3-drop that does a different cool thing. For Gut, True Soul, Zealot. Whenever you attack, you may sacrifice another creature or an artifact. If you do, you make a 4-1 skeleton with Menace that's tapped and attacking. That seems really good, actually. It's also surprising for an uncommon. Like, it's whenever you attack, so it doesn't have to be with Gut. You can attack with anything. And you can attack any artifact to make a 4-1 with Menace that's tapped and attacking. That's That seems great. I'm actually surprised I don't have this in my cube now that I look at it. I think it's because I saw choose a background and I was like, well, you can't do that in cube. So I just didn't, I just didn't include it. It's a true powerhouse as well as soul zealot. So be on the lookout for this one, turning spare treasure tokens, spare tre treasure, treasure and blood tokens into four, one attackers with menace ends the game quickly. If unanswered the key here, gut doesn't need to attack herself. Sacrificing moxes to win games feels downright decadent. I don't like calling them moxen. It feels weird and pretentious, so I just call them moxes. Sulfuric, I, this, this is actually a cool swap. I, I think Gut's going to be fun to play. Uh, Sulfuric Vortex out for Rampaging Ferocidon. Vortex still has a powerful, important ability, but doesn't go in many decks. Ferocidon carries the same ability, but on a beefy body, which is way more reasonable than just about any deck that wants to send creatures into combat. This card's just bananas. I have it in my cube. I also have this updated... Uh, a special guest version because I think it looks great. Thunder Maul Hellkite out for Ember Cleave. Removing dragons got pushed. Removing dragons got pushed back from the Vintage Cube community previously, but Ember Cleave offers a similar punching through ability that Thunder Maul provides, but it's not a dragon. Ember Cleave is particularly exciting in this iteration because of increased artifact synergies and because you can strap it onto two mana, five power creatures like Neshoba Brawler and Territorial Kavu. I mean, yeah, no one's no one's arguing that Ember Cleave's not a busted beating. Zealous Conscripts is out for Flame Tongue Kavu. I don't know how I feel about this. I think Zealous is good outside of the Kiki Jiki, outside of like Splinter Twin combo. I think it's just really, really good. Zealous Conscripts could have stayed in despite the Kiki Twin package rotation. Yeah. As it is certainly a great card on its own, but we don't want to send mixed signals. Flame Tongue Kavu gets carried by the same reasoning as Flame Slash here, which is hitting a major percentage of creatures in the cube. But with an aggressively statted body attached, it's also important to bring back nostalgic cards, especially mechanically simple ones when the metagame uh, puts it in a position to be good. I, I, I love Flame Tongue Kavu. Invasion Block and Odyssey Block are two of my absolute favorite blocks. They're kind of when I started playing competitively in Magic. And they have an incredible amount of nostalgia for me. So you will not find me complaining about Flame Tongue Kavu. I will complain that you're using the Dominaria Remastered art, not the original Invasion art here, but or the Plane Shift art, but what are you going to do? Arbor Elf out 
for Grazer. I don't like this, but you're doing lands, so it's fine. Um, I, you know, having Utopia Sprawl and being able to untap it or being able to untap a breeding pool and get an extra blue, like, that's very versatile. Our Boiler Grazer is an important part, an important tool for the lands archetype blocking to keep yourself alive after putting extra lands on the battlefield, sure. Birthing Pot is out, should have never been in the cube. I think Birthing Pot is way too hard to build around. I think it's a trap. I think it's like Oath of Druids. And I would love if they took Oath of Druids out as well. We'll see. Uh, for Sentinel of the Nameless City, Sentinel is a fantastic card. Uh, it's a card I was also tempted to put into my cube. I have I, I picked up... What I do um, for my cube is whenever a new set comes out, I look for all the cards that I would ever think of putting in the cube, and I pick up one of the versions that I want, and then I put them in a thing called the Maybe Board, which is actually this box right here. And these are all the Maybe Board cards. So, you, like, I would have... Like, here's an Agadim's Awakening, right? So, you know, this is just all the cards that could potentially make it into the cube. Here's an ancient, a secret layer ancient grudge. I don't know if you guys can a little doggy on it. So it's just like, it's cards that like, I might want to play one day. It's also, it's also cards that were in the cube and then were taken out. Because like this article is, is also stating that like sometimes when you take a card out of the cube, it's not because it was bad. It's just not its time. But like if you bring something back, the cards you take out could easily be good again because they're usually pretty evergreen magic cards that are just very versatile. Three, four for three with vigilance. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, you create a map token. So this guy can amass a bunch of map tokens and making a bunch of treasure, map, food, blood tokens seems like a really good payoff for like the, the archetypes they're, they're trying to create. Birthing Pod is a prime candidate for rotating archetype status. It asks a lot of both cube and, and deck construction agree completely it's it's very hard to build around it doesn't pay off consistently enough to have earned the mainstay there's there's green decks where i'll be like four three drops four four drops one five drop two six drops and i'm like i'm literally never going to be able to ramp up from four to five if i ever draw my five drop it's just it's just and then you're like well i guess i'll cut it i guess i'll just cut birthing pod and then it's out uh, this time, this time, another LCI powerhouse makes its vintage cube debut. Sentinel is efficient, attacks and blocks well, makes artifacts, helps with extra land drops, and can fill your graveyard. Agree, this card is great. Um, and it's a warrior. So it's like there's so many relevant fe features on this card. Like it's a three mana three four, which is a super great rate. It has vigilance. It does a thing not only when it comes into the play, but also when it attacks. And it's a warrior. Like it's, it's got a lot going on. It's a great card. Deranged Hermit out. The show a brawler in. Okay. Hermit will handle the squirrel. Yeah, I also don't have both hermits, and I'm, I'm surprised that they did. Again, this is a card where it's like, this card doesn't see play nearly enough to warrant the redundancy of having two exact copies of it. Um, I've had Deranged Hermit out for a while. I have I have Deep Forest Hermit in because I just think it's so much better to be able to keep your guy for three turns without having to pay Echo. And let's be honest, Deranged Hermit himself, after you pay the Echo, is probably not staying around longer than three turns anyway. Um... So, yeah, this is a card that has not been in my cube for quite a while. Uh, and I had opposition. So now they're taking out opposition, and I guess they're still leaving Deep Forest Hermit in. Uh, Deep Forest Hermit will handle square wrangling in this iteration, so we'll bring in the Brawler for domain support with Triumphs around. This can get beefy pretty easily, but it's also just fine as a two mana, three, three, three. I, yeah, this card's great. Like, really, really impressive. Like, it really goes to show, like, <laughs> wild in the cattle power creep when this guy could be a five, three with trample for two mana. Kind of wild. Gargaroth out. Gargaroth is a card I think is just fantastic. It, It's also a green card that does everything. Vigilance, Reach, Trample. It's impossible to get past if they have it on defense, which they will because it's it's got Vigilance. It's impossible to fly over. Uh, whenever it attacks or blocks, you're either making a 3-3, gaining life, or drawing a card. Like, it does everything. And they're putting in Ogre, Cal Kaslam, Deepest Growth. I think this card is also phenomenal. So maybe this is fine. <laughs> the problem is I like both of these, but I really, I'm glad they're trying this guy out because this card is super exciting. Whenever this deals combat damage to a player, and it has Trample, so that's easier, reveal that many cards from the top of your library. You may put a creature card and or a land from among them onto the battlefield, put the rest on the bottom. And then it's, one, it's a flip card. So like when it dies, it, it can come back if certain conditions met. Gargaroth is still a beefy boy and may return soon, but the god is worth a try for sure, especially with the lands archetype rotating in. This can also be a nice one to sneak attack. Agreed. Yeah, this card's cool. 
green finale is out. I don't know why I read green. Like as if we're like, this is green all of a sudden. Sorry. There's a lot to go over here. Finale out for Scape Shift. I mean, that's just fine. I, I haven't had Finale for a while. The problem is, again, redundancy. I'm a big fan of cutting redundancy. And the cards in my cube are Invasion of... It's either Ixalan or Ikoria. I forgot the one that lets you search. I think it's Ikoria. And Green Sun Zenith. Finale of Devastation is doing a similar thing. It's either green or green green to search your library or graveyard for a creature. It's the same thing. So I just, I replaced Finale with uh, Invasion of Ixalan, Ikoria. Uh, losing some creature tutor redundancy here for a cornerstone of the incoming lands archetype. Combine this with Dryad of the Elysian Grove or Prismatic Omen and Valakut, the Molten Pinnacle for a quick combo kill with everything counting as a mountain. Yeah, obviously it works nice with Heatron Crab, Field, and Titania. Sure, that's fine. Um, I think it's funny because we're talking about like how like we're taking out Bizarre because it only works in like one archetype, but like we're bringing in Prismatic Omen, which is like it also only works in this one archetype. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what else. Like Valakut is the only card that really works with Prismatic Omen, right? I guess it can just be a fix fix your mana. Force of Vigor out. I didn't even know this card was in. For Nature's Claim, interesting. Force of Vigor is pretty clunky if you aren't hitting two things, so it's mainly a sideboard card. Nature's Claim, on the other hand, is very main deckable. We all know how good instant speed removal for one mana is, even while giving your opponent some life. Um, yes, but I also... I don't know. I don't really care one way or the other about this swap. Horned Queen is out for guff for gruff triplets. I put gruff triplets in my cube. That's hilarious. That's so it's so nice to have like other people also have the same kind of mindset as you. Gruff triplets is a 3-3 for six with trample. And then you make two tokens that are gruff triplets. So you have three gruff triplets. Gruff triplets. Then when one dies, Put a number of 1-1 counters equal to its power on each creature you control in it. So you got three of them. It's very it's very precursor golem, except better. So then one dies. Now you have two. But now they become 6-6s six because they each get three counters. So now you have two 6-6s. Six and then one dies. And now you have the six counters going to the other one. And now you have 12-12. So like you have to deal with it three times. And each time you deal with it, the other ones just get better. I didn't know how good this card would be, but it's nice to see that it's in this cube because I can actually try it out now, and I, I like to think we're on the same page, so that's kind of refreshing. We're rotating out World Smite Worm in this iteration as two one note with flash and pretty mid outside of that exact application. The triplet should nicely bridge the gap, being very castable, but also good with flash, reanimation, etc. Yeah, that's interesting. World Smite Worm is a one note card for sure. It's very exciting when you get it though, when you hit that one note. It's also good with sneak though. It's good with sneak and through the breach. So that's interesting. Is it not? You go sneak attack, you put World Spine Worm in, you deal 15, it dies, and then you get the three five fives, right? Like, that's... It's still a major archetype. Invasion of Ikoria out. Okay, so... Yeah, this is, this is the other finale effect for Lotus Cobra. I don't love that. <laughs> I think Lotus Cobra is done, man. I don't know. Lotus Cobra doesn't excite me, but it's fine. He's It's not a bad man. Lotus Cobra is a great card in general. Oh, my bad, I guess. Being able to pressure your opponent's life total while also producing mana with fetch lands, things can get pretty explosive. And when combined with fast spawn and a bounce land, you can even have a little DIY channel going. Yeah, but I mean, it's fast spawned. It's busted. Draga Tree Speaker out for Sakura Tribe Scout. I don't like this because I feel like they're changing the green deck from like ramp and big aggressive things which i kind of love i just love drafting the arena deck sometimes with channel um i guess they're leaving channel in and it looks like they're just changing it to like more of a land strategy the mono green ramp archetype has suffered a lot in recent years what used to be called green soaring is often a liability given how often you have to level it up into open mana in order to execute your plan the tribe scout allows for extra land drops every turn but you have to have the lands in your hand Doing the best exploration impression it can in support of the lands archetype and incidental landfall cards. So now we have both Explore and Sakura Tribe Scout. That's the problem with Dryad of the Elysian Grove as well, where it's like, I mean, it's great that you can put lands into play, but like, I don't have that many lands in my hand. Oath of Druids is out for Prismatic Omen. That makes total sense. Oath, I don't think is Oath is a fun card. It's a very narrow card. It forces you to build bad decks 
in the hopes that you get to Oath. And it just doesn't work out a lot. Oath is another cool iconic card that should move away from mainstay to occasional appearances. Oath rotates out into its new life in an archetype package. Prismatic Omen comes in with an archetype package as a crucial, crucial enabler for Valakut, while also having some incidental interaction with High Tide and the Domain archetype as well. Oh, okay, I can see that. That's actually not bad for Domain. That makes a lot of sense. Regrowth out, Spelunking in. Not really the same. Um, as long as we have Eternal Witness, I think it's fine. I don't think you need that much redundancy. I've had Regrowth out for a while. I think I brought it back in recently. I'm actually checking right now. No, I actually don't have Regrowth in mine. I never put it back in. Yeah, I think it's because I have, yeah, I was like, Eternal Witness does this. I don't, again, like, redundancy is important because, like, you only get 540 slots. And I know it sounds like a lot, but they fill up quick. So, like, if I have three cards doing the same exact thing and I want to play a cool new card from Lost Caverns or something, like, I, I want to be able to put it in. Like, come on. This list is so long. <laughs> okay. So, Regrowth will surely be missed by anyone who opens Time Walk, but we did get a Tameo Collector of Tales in recent updates. And Regrowth... Yeah, that's, that's another card that does the same thing. And Regrowth isn't used much outside of Time Walk decks. Right. So, like, Tameo is already blue, so you're going to be playing it in your blue deck. The only thing we're getting back with Regrowth is Time Walk and Ancestral anyway. Come on. Spelunking works nicely with Bounce Lands and lets you do your best Amulet Titan impression. Yeah, it's not bad. Thrun is out, which is fine for Goyf. Don't like that. I think Goyf is much too conditional. It's much too hard to build around. Maybe they're putting enough stuff in here where it matters, but I don't know. With beefy green midrange decks back on the rise and a lot of cheap artifacts meant to be sacrificed, we think it's Tarmogoyf's time to shine once again. Thrun wasn't all that great. It's true. And when it did work, it wasn't all that fun. Even if it had been stellar, perhaps especially, we want to rotate powerful but aggravating cards so you don't run into the same non-interactive game ender in every iteration. Utopia Sprawl out. So that makes that that actually makes sense for the Arbor Elf removal. For Dryad, I've had Dryad in for a long time. Um, but the reason is also I have a five-color strategy in my cube with um, the following cards. I have Garth One-Eye, Invasion of Alara, Jared Karth Lion, Niv Mizzet Reborn, Omnath, Locus of All, the five-color um March of the March of Machines look uh, I'm not and I have two two headed Hellkite, so I have a bunch of different five color cards, and I also have the it's a Celestia two drop, um, named Jensen Carthalion, which is like you can tap five and him to add five one of each color, and whenever you cast a multicolor spell, scry one if that spell was all all colors create a four four white angel, so like I'm kind of incentivizing players to draft five colors and Dryad of the Elysian Grove along with like, um. It's not Coalition Relic. It is Chromatic Lantern. Also encourages that. So it's another Crucial Priest for Valak. Cut the Molten Pinnacle and great for Domain, but also just a solid card. Sprawl is powerful as a mana ramp that can be destroyed easily, but we will rotate well, we will rotate it out with its good buddy Arbor Elf and bring them back some time together. Sure. Workshop Warchief. This just should never play. I think this guy's just... I didn't think so at first, but I do think this guy is just worse than, uh, than Thrag Tusk. And I just don't think... Like, I don't even think Thrag Tusk is that good. Please don't tell Katie I said that. Workshop War Chief out for Wild Nacatl. We are bringing the curve down here to add the Domain Warrior Wild Nacatl to the mix. I think the Domain deck seems really sweet. Worm out, we knew, for Astral Dragon. 4-4 four, four for 6. When it enters the battlefield, create two tokens that are copies of target non-creature permanent. So not even cre not even not creatures. Except they're 33 dragon creatures in addition to their other types, and they have flying. Worm is great in the Flash deck, but a bit narrow otherwise. Since we're cutting a premium Flash target, but keeping Flash will compensate with the Astral Dragon, which is also a cool Flash and recurring Nightmare target, but can also make infinite dragons with Parallax Wave. Interesting. I mean, that's kind of cool. Ren and Realmbreaker out. I don't think this card is good at all. I think it's like a worse Dryad of the Elysian Grove that can't protect itself. Um, the fact that the plus one doesn't actually untap the land. So on turn three, you're like, turn three, play Ren and Realm Breaker, plus one. Doesn't untap my land, so you can still just attack it. Uh, Court of Garen Brig. When this enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. For three mana, that seems really strong. At the beginning of your upkeep, distribute two 1-1 one -one counters among two target creatures. Then if you're the Monarch, double the number of 1-1 one -one counters in each creature you control. This seems really strong. A lot of the court cards are really oppressive. <laughs> So I'm hoping this doesn't end up as a mistake. Um, especially in a green deck who can probably defend their monarchy on turn. This is like, you, you play this on turn two, it's going to be very hard to contest, it feels like. 
Brennan Rombreaker performed fine, but Court of Garenbreaker seems strong enough to warrant trying, especially with green moving more in the direction of aggressive mid-range. It can also help generate ridiculous amounts of mana with Devoted Druid. Oh yeah, you just keep putting counters on it. Uh, Soul Herder is out for Tamishi, a reality architect. There's your boy. And this is whenever one or more non-creature permanents uh, are returned to your hand, draw a card. And it only triggers once each turn. But then you can return a land you control to its owner's hand to return an artifact or enchantment card with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is actually a very intricate and interesting card. Like, it does a lot of obscure things. Solar Herder will be missed by some, but we hope Tamishi will be enjoyed by many. Pretty much any card that can go do busted things with Black Lotus is going to be at least fine in Vintage Cube. But there's so much more it synergizes with in this iteration, like Seal of Removal, Spell Bombs, and Bounce Lands. Yeah, this feels like it's going to be a fun architect archetype to draft. Urza's out. Oh, this is Urza Lord Protector. This makes sense, but I also don't think the Might Stone and Weak Stone is strong enough on its own to be in the cube. Honestly, you weren't melding a lot, but it was super fun for a lot of players that aren't like hyper competitive spikes to want to meld these cards like myself. Um, oh yes, Shirokai Genesis Engine has been in my cube for like two years now. This card is super exciting. I, I put this in as soon as I found it in the uh, Neon Genesis, Neon Dynasty, Neon Genesis. <laughs> not not too off the mark. The Neon Dynasty spoilers for Commander. Uh, well, not being able to live the Meld Dream is unfortunate. That's what I'm saying. The Might Stone and Weak Stone is fine on its own. Eh. While well, Urza falls a little short, especially when occupying a precious multicolor slot. Shurokai, on the other hand, does a lot of cool things with this update. It draws cards, which is something the artifact decks can never get enough of, given all the slots used to ramp. Yeah, like, this draws you two and you discard one for one mana, and then it makes a pilot. So, like, it just does a lot for one activation, and then you just get to do it every turn. Um, it does a lot of cool things. It draws cards, which is something artifact can never get enough of slots to ramp. Uh, it plays nicely with Staff of the Storyteller for even more value, and the pilot token can crew the newly added Heart of Kieran and Sky Sovereign console flagship. Yeah, that's that's actually a lot of relevant things. This card is super cool. I'm looking forward to drafting this a ton. It has a real, like, blue-white mid-game card draw engine, like a Teferi Hero of Dominaria feel to it, and I'm, like, I, I'm so excited. I, I get excited when there's cards that I, like, obscure, like, Timmy cards that I put in my cube that I think are super cool and powerful. And then to see them like also put in the vintage cube is, is super nice. So Scarab God comes out for Sunken Ruins. There's a lot of choices that I understand, but I don't necessarily love because I do like these cards. Scarab God is not dead by any means, but it has seen better days. Five mana is a lot. And we need the space for, I mean like they, like saying things like five mana is a lot. But that's only dependent on the way you're building the vintage cube. You're choosing to make it a lot, right? Like, it's not, it's a dynamic thing. It's not like the vintage cube comes a certain way and we just have to put cards in based on how it comes. Like, no, I mean, like, you're choosing to make it a lot. Like, you could slow it down. You could put more mid-range stuff in there. You could do lots of things, right? But, like, if you're leaning towards these these, these broken, cheap strategies, like, yes, five mana is going to be a lot. But let's not make it sound like, um, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. That's just how it goes. We need the space for the extra land cycle. Sunken Ruins is a major doomsday enabler with the color demands of the archetype, along with Pentad Prism and Urborg. Okay, so Urborg is in here. I don't know if they added it or if it just stayed in here. But... That's good. I, I agree with Sunken Ruins. Thief is out for Kaito. Mm, I don't think Kaito is... I think Thief does cooler stuff than Kaito. Kaito is just draw a card than discard unless you attacked. Negative two, make a one one ninja. I can't be blocked. And then negative seven, you're never gonna negative seven, I don't think. Mostly a change of pace, but a slight upgrade nonetheless. Kaito has been missed by many, and while Thief of Sanity will have its mourners as well, we can always bring it back, sure. That's fine. I mean, I have Kaito in mind. No, I don't. I think I have the, the four mana Kaito in mind now. But Kaito is in my maybe board. Yeah, I have Kaito Dancing Shadow. I did have this one, and then I think I replaced it. Assassin's Trophy out for Witherbloom Command. That's fine. Neither, I don't have any sentimental attachment to either of these two. The modal versatility of Witherbloom Command beats out the Assassin's Trophy that, while powerful, too often comes at a price you can't afford to pay and expect to win the game. Really? But, like, Path to Exile does the same thing, and we're keeping that. 
That's interesting because this kills any permanent. Like, so if you're able to kill like a sneak attack or a opposition or something, I mean that, I mean that's a cost. You'll, I'll pay. The, I'll give them a land. That's fine. Fiend artisan out. Totally fine. This card is not. It's kind of meh. For Moss Wood Dread Knight, another card I have in my cube. I just think this is totally fine. Two mana to draw a card, and then you just get a bunch of value off of this guy. Fiend Artisan will rotate out to join the Birthing Pot Archetype package, while Moss Wood Dread Knight enters as a solid value engine with a reasonable body. Black or Green Talisman out for Simic Growth Chamber. Uh, we're cutting some of the talismans, which are a bit less desirable to make room for extra lands. Don't worry, we're keeping the most relevant ones around. Vraska for Rot Farm. Sure. Because again, the four mana, you're like, man, four mana. Oof. Like, it's funny because I look at the Vintage Cube and I'm like, I want to cast a five mana Muldra for to draw two cards. I want to cast a Consecrated Sphinx. I want to, but I think I, I also want interactive games where I'm able to, like, play a spell. You can respond to it, and then you play a spell, and then I get to respond to it. Whereas, like, I feel like if we're complaining about the cost of four mana cards, like, that it's, you basically just want one, two, and three mana stuff that's, like, really going to win the game quickly. Maybe I'm just a boomer. Kogla and Yudaro come out. Eh, it's fine. For Kavu, that makes sense. Uh, nice experiment. The card felt too narrow to keep. We're making room for Territorial Kavu to support Domain. Talisman of Impulse is out. So red-green Talisman out for Gruel Turf. Cutting some of the... As stated in the article, are they just saying... Okay, they just copied and pasted it. They copied and pasted it here too. Magma Opus is out for Fire Ice. I would honestly just rather have Magma Opus. <laughs> I'm way more excited about casting a magma opus than I am a fire ice, but I, I know I'm I know I'm fairly Timmy in some ways. Uh, white black talisman out for shattered sanctum. Oh my god, it just keeps going. Duretti, I ingenious iconoclast is out. Really, they're just talking about all these artifact decks, and this guy makes artifacts. So, but the ring and vile smasher. Whenever you cast your first spell, choose an opponent at random. So he was gonna always gonna choose regular opponent. Vile smasher, the fear steals damage equal to that spell's converted mana cost to that player or planeswalker. That seems that seems really strong. Uh, Duretti's still great, no doubt, but a little change of scenery is nice from time to time. Vile Smasher lives up to the name with whatever spells you happen to have in your deck, but becomes quickly game-ending when combined with cards like Fire Blast, Pyrokinesis, or Contagion. Yeah, that's really strong. It's also each turn. So you can cast one on your turn, and then cast one on their turn. I don't know. We'll see how that works out. Graven Cairns is out for Haunted Ridge. Since we're benching Croxa and Cruel Ultimatum this time, Haunted Ridge is likely that are mana fixing. I agree, but you also have doomsday which you just wanted to and like beseech the queen so you wanted to have something that made double black with sunken ruins so that's interesting i guess they're going i guess it's because sunken ruins also cast like oracle and jace jace wielder of mysteries is triple blue so that actually makes sense crocs is out for molten collapse this card's good this this would be a strict upgrade to uh to dreadbore poor dreadbore uh, more LCI cube additions. While an upgraded Dreadbore is arguably still not incredible, the added versatility is worth bringing it back to see how much better it plays. Getting your opponent's mox and two drop creature after fetching fixing for your molten collapse sounds like a game swinging play. Yeah, there's a lot of potential here. It's a very strong card. Red black talisman out for restless vents. Good choice. I agree. Kitchen Finks out. I don't even know what I was in here. For Renegade Rallier, when this enters the battlefield, if a permanent you controlled left the battlefield this turn, return target permanent with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Kitchen Finks has been around forever without a real purpose. Renegade Rallier isn't much more exciting than Finks in the abstract, but it does some nice things in the lands archetype with strip mine and fetch lands and supports the domain warriors theme as well. Getting back into Shoba Brawler or Territory Kavu, Territorial Kavu is pretty nice. Yeah, I think this is fine if you're, it's also a warrior, which is super, once you see it's a warrior, it's like, mm, okay, that does make more sense. Knight of Autumn out, which I think is very versatile for Pride Mage. I don't like that. I like Knight of Autumn a lot, but like, I don't like having to sacrifice this. This is the same. It's like, might as well have, um, Zealous, Zealous, I forgot his name. It's the green, green two, one that you sacrifice to destroy an artifact or enchantment from like Mirrodin. Green is now a lot more proficient at attacking. So this is what makes a lot of sense. We already know how good Exalted can be from the Hierarchs. Sigarda is out, which is fine for Torsten. That's, this card has been great for Flash. Um, another addition inspired by the Alpha Frog Vintage Cube. More Flash Sneak Nightmare support to compensate from the loss of Worldspine Worm, but hard castable by most green decks as well. 
Talisman of Unity is out for Celestia Sanctuary. Repeated. Voice is out, which is fine for Avacyn's Pilgrim. That's interesting. With a couple of greens, one melee accelerant's moving out. Bringing this one back feels correct in support of greens increased multicolor focus in this iteration. Yeah, but I feel like Arbor Elf is just better than that, right? Like, I guess maybe if you're not playing a ton of basics. I don't know. Cannon is out, which I really, really liked for Bring to Light, sure. Uh, it was a cool twist on things and definitely will be back in the not-so-distant future, but for now we needed the space for Bring to Light. It's a great tutor for the lands deck as it finds important pieces like Scape Shift and Omnath, but also works on other strategies and just combos on its own with Valky. And Delayed fire, delayed Blast Fireball. Yeah, I, I actually love Bring to Light and it's going to make me draft a bunch of five-color decks around it that do not have anything to do with lands, I assure you. Okay, well we're getting close to the end here. Cruel Ultimatum for Stormcarve Coast. It was fun having the Ultimatum, but it rotates out with Dream Halls. Sure, that's fine. Inspired for Deserted Beach, same thing. Kenrith, Return King is out, which makes sense for the Weather Seed Treaty. Uh, search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield, tapped for three mana, create a 1 1 Sapperling. And then target creature you control gets plus X and trample, where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control. That does a lot. It doesn't fetch dual lands, but it's a very versatile powerhouse for the domain archetype. Don't forget about the read ahead ability. You may be able to skip. Does this have read ahead? Oh, interesting. I don't think I've ever even read that, to be honest with you, let alone read ahead. Um, I think it's interesting because, like, if you just look at this, you just think it's a saga, but the fact that you can read ahead. Let me know in the comments if you knew Read Ahead was a thing. If you guys aren't standard players, you might not have known. I, I didn't play standard for, for Dominaria United, so I had no idea Read Ahead was even a thing. I feel like I might have remembered it vaguely, but then I never remembered it enough to, to keep it in mind. You may be able to skip right to victory. It's also nice to recur with Sarah Paragon and Simeon's Reclamation. Sure. Leovold out for Soul of Wind Grace. Soul of Wind Grace is a, a, a good card. It's a 5-4 for 4. It does a bunch of stuff, dude. Leovold can certainly still hang and way back in the future, but he demands three colors. So does Soul of Wind Grace. <laughs> and has to look out for Hall Breacher this time. Uh, Soul of Wind Grace is here to support lands while also being great in the mid-range. Uh, being a great mid-range threat, sure. Mana Confluence for Valakut. That's fine, you gotta cut something for it. We're adding a bit of fixing with the extra lands we're bringing in, but also paying life every turn to make your plays can sometimes bite you in today's era. And in today's era, it does so more frequently than ever. I've talked enough about Valakut's applications by now, so I'll leave it at that. Sphinx out for Thopter Foundry. I mean, it's one Esper card for another. Sphinx has been relegated to obnoxious sideboard card, so it's overdue for cutting. I kind of agree. I do like it. It's a card I really like, but it's true. It's just a... You, you only bring it in against the green and red decks, really. Thopter Foundry fills another new combo and combined with Sword, but can also be a great role player with cards like Staff, Storyteller, One Ring, Coveted Jewel, etc. Soul Cauldron for Unlicensed Hearse. I, I actually picked up an Unlicensed Hearse. One, because it's $2 and not $50, like I get the Soul Cauldron. But also, I just think it's a cool card that fulfills the same role as Agatha's, Agatha's Soul Cauldron. So this is funny to see this, because this is actually the kind of change I made. The Cauldron's a cool card, but another one of those I'd like to save for another iteration with more support for it. Unlicensed Hearse is more proficient as a graveyard hit. Yeah, and this guy just gets really big really fast. Because it also presents a pretty lethal clock down the line, and Reanimator definitely needs to be kept in check. City of Traders I did not like. Bringing back Sheldock Isle. I approve. Uh, Sheldock is back. Enough said. Seriously, though, this probably was my biggest mistake, and I'm walking it back. It also has a nice extra application this time around, because it does combo with Doomsday. <sighs> Cauldron for Sword of the Meek? I don't like that. I would rather you take out Batter Skull, or even, I'd honestly, rather you take out Endural. I think this is one of the best targets for Stoneforge, and if you're keeping Stoneforge, it, it's really sad that you're taking this out. Stoneforge will miss Cauldron, but it's often clunky and has limited application outside of that combo. There are also more widely applicable Stoneforge targets coming into the cube with Nettle Cyst and Shadow Spear. I don't know, Shadow Spear is not super impressive to me personally, but I think it's good. Nothing is keeping us from. See, that's the thing, like, Shadow Spear is it good? Yeah. Is it is it exciting? No. Cauldron Complete is it good? Yeah. Is it exciting? Yeah. Like, and that's that's more important to me, I think. Mind Slaver is out for Coveted Jewel. We knew that was going to happen. Not many minds have been successfully enslaved. And even when it works, it's not fun if your opponent makes you play it out. So we'll take a different route with this slot. Are you ready for Jewel Shops? The Jewel can definitely be a double-edged sword, but when there are enough sacrifice outlets such that you should be able to craft a build that leaves you safe way more often than sorry. Okay, we got four more. Mirage Mirror is out for Manifold... Oh, God. 
Wait. Interesting. They didn't bring in Time Vault, which is nice. Mirage Mirror is out for Manifold Key. Mirage Mirror is fine, but only has a few scenarios where it truly gets to shine, so we're pulling it back. As for Manifold Key, don't worry, we're not adding Time Vault with it. Okay. Great. Addressing my concerns already. But there are plenty of other worthwhile applications besides just untapping your big mana rocks, like Mana Vault and Grim Monolith. You can combine it with Shorokai Genesis Engine to make more tokens and draw more cards, not to mention the One Ring. That's actually interesting. There are a ton of applications for a Manifold Key, and then making your eyes unblockable is just also fine. Uh, but it's also fun and potent with Sensei's Divining Top and Retrofitter Foundry. Don't forget to make your constructs unblockable. Yeah, exactly. Relic is out for Soul Guide Lantern. I don't care about either of these, to be honest. I think there's plenty of graveyard stuff in the cube. Making this swamp because sometimes you don't want to be hitting your own graveyard in order to exile your opponents. It seems fine. Uh, Solemn is out for Roaming Throne. I don't care about Solemn. I think it's a great flex spot. Uh, this is a format of 4 4 for, with Ward 2. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. You're probably going to choose Warriors. Uh, it's a chosen type in addition to its other types. If a triggered ability of, an, of another creature you control of the chosen type triggers, it triggers an additional time. Solemn's okay, and with Birthing Pod it out, can take a rest. Roaming Throne is a much better body with some thoughtful drafting and deck building. Will easily outvalue the sad robot. Try it with new additions Luminarch Aspirant or Nahila the Blade Blossom, who are warriors. Ulamog out for Cityscape Leveler. That's fine. Casting Ulamog is definitely more devastating, but also a lot harder to do. Leveler does help the uh, workshop decks. Yeah, because this being an artifact is pretty good, because now all of a sudden you can cast it off Mitra's Workshop. Um, So we'll give it the nod this time. But I mean, like Sundering Titan and Mere Battlesphere, you were already able to do that. It's not like you were missing top end guys. Yeah, like I agree with a lot of these changes. I disagree with some of them. Um, I... We, I think we have different philosophies, but I think that's also fine. I think Vintage Cubes, um, the thing I love about Cubes the most is the amount of customization and personalization you can put into your Cubes. And um, yeah, I, I think these are good changes. I, I think if nothing else, even if I don't agree with every single change, I appreciate how thoughtful Chris and Ryan um, have been about their um, their decisions. And yeah. Uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Let me know what you guys think. Um, let me know what you think of these changes, what you would have changed, what you wouldn't have changed. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate you. I'll see you in the queues.